Hey everyone, and welcome to At The Table, the only show that uh, invites you to pull up a chair, get out your books or your, your websites, and join us at the table. Today we're going to be discussing some fun little everyday archetypes, you know, for the common person going out there, and sometimes adventure is just a day of living. But yep. Before we do that, let us go in to introduce each other. First of all, my man, Mr. Michael Powell, please tell them who you are and where they can find you on that sweet, sweet internet. Uh. Well, I'm Michael Powell, and you can find me all over the internet uh, via my social media handle, which is at Mr. Kapow. That's M-R-K-A-P-A-O. And how about you, PJ? My name is PJ McGaw. You can find me everywhere at PJ.McGaw. Uh, when I'm not here on Tuesdays, we're on Wednesdays for Edge of Legends. And with Halloween good and behind us and the spoopy season, just a faint and fun memory. Tomorrow, we're getting back to Woodward, Rufa, Ilona, Shiona Biss. Uh, am I forgetting? Oh, and of course, the amazing, the transcendent, the transplendent, Luchadores, uh, La Pacifadorita. Uh, as they go about their amazing adventure with all the, all the war stuff. So uh, we're getting back on track with that. And uh, without further ado, let's get started on these um, three everyday archetypes. Oh, did I forget something? Yes, uh, PJ, really quick. Uh, in yes. chat, we got Pengu Chan asked, saying that we are super quiet, apparently. So let's enunciate and talk in our stage voices. Oh, wow. I, someone's telling me I'm quiet. <laughs> That can't be right. Okay. You know what I bet? I think the problem is I've plugged in my microphone. I think it's not using the right microphone. But while I check my uh, some audio levels really fast, Mr. Michael Powell, I believe I might have stepped on a few words. Please, what were you about to say before you did introductions? Oh, um, really quick. One of the things I want to say was the archetypes that we are talking about today are also kind of known as the profession archetypes these are as pj says like more like jobs that your character might have uh other than you know oh i hit stuff really really hard even though we all know pj likes the we hit stuff really really <laughs> hard type abilities this is more the thinking man these are the these are the rufa-esque Ooh, we're going yes, rufa-esque Rufa how does, the, um, uh, how does my audio sound? A little better right now? I changed my mic. A little better, mind. a little better. Um, you Good. sound a little hollow, though. Ah, uh, okay. Let me try this again. Okay. But, yeah, um, this is more your thinking man's, your, oh, I can make this thing really, really good. I can talk my way out of this. I have connections and et cetera, <laughs> you know. These are your job jobs. I think it's also really important to say that what these archetypes and many other archetypes in this amazing book, mm -hmm. have to offer is the rarity of having a class or a character or a, a person come to life in more than just the hyperbolic. You know, you're not kicking down the door as this level 20 dragon disciple barbarian. I mean, I would, because that sounds friggin' metal as hell. But you can just see what it's like to go on an adventure with a bunch of heroes as just a combat medic you're like mm -hmm. I, I am forlorn glory morning and i you know i am the paladin of the sun what do you do um i know first aid very well or I'm a, or uh i'm an archaeologist call me uh call me jones yeah I'm here to make sure that that tesseract of many nightmares goes into a museum because that's where it belongs. Mm -hmm. or, or not. Hey, I know how to track people very, very well and get paid mm -hmm. for it. Exactly. This is the way. <laughs> Hashtag this is the way. <laughs> this is the way. Also, like, think about how many times have we as, as players of TTRPGs sat down at a table and said, my character is a rogue who is a bounty hunter. And then what do you have to show for that? What is really the only thing that makes you a bounty hunter in those instances? Usually it's just a very convoluted and very edgy backstory with nothing to show for it. You know, it's like saying, I am an alchemist and I'm very smart and I'm worldly or I'm a bard. I'm also an archaeologist. 
what do you have to show for it? It's always nothing but backstory fluff. Now what we get to do is get crunchy. We get to represent the power of your backstory and show the world that heroes can just be everyday people doing their job. Yep. And without further ado, I think we should step into this uh, eclectic collection of collegiate... Co nope. Okay, it's done. I, brain fart. Not, not happening. Anyway, uh, I think uh, PJ wants to say... <laughs> We're yeah, I, I was, uh, okay, we're gonna kick things off with the archaeologist archetype. <laughs> Michael Powell with the assist. Yes, please. Let's go with the archaeologist. This is your uh, Indiana Jones, your we need to get this into a museum, your even warehouse thirteen ask uh Ooh, yeah. 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 I'm going in deep with the fandom there. I am actually really good friends with some people from Warehouse 13. Uh, they are good people, and that mm -hmm. show deserves way more credit. Oh, yeah. Uh, or even, I want to say, um, Fringe. Another great show. Mm hmm But, uh, yeah. I'm going to read the little flavor text they have here. Adventurers raid tombs for material gain, but true archaeologists treasure the knowledge gained from such sites. You might accomplish your goals with scholarly learning, by training to overcome the tricks and traps set by ancient people and rivals through magical training or even with a bit of inexplicable luck. So yeah, you're basically Indiana Jones. Yeah. Now, what's cool about this uh, archetype, in every archetype in the book, it'll, it'll have the information at the very beginning. Once you get to that really choice uh, flavor text, they'll say additional feats. And what these mean is that at these levels that they mention, there are the abilities that come with the class. However, instead of taking those abilities, you can instead choose a general, a specific general feat from the book that they describe. Mm -hmm. So at, at, at level four, if you don't like any of the things that the archaeologist gets at level four, you can just take the feat Trap Finder. Yeah. Free feat. Not bad. Yeah. And at level 10, if you don't like the thing you get at level 10, you can just get delay trap. So, you know, let's say the, uh, the rogue sparks a spear tr uh, trap and it's shooting out of the ground. You can make it go slower. So they have opportunities. To, yeah, you could, you you could get bullet it. time of stuff. This is my bullet time impression. It's terrible. But, anyway. yeah, uh, really quick in chat, um, Penguin Chan apparently – also really likes uh, Warehouse 13. Warehouse 13, love in chat. Uh, Sydney with, uh, oh my god, Indiana Jones, though. Pengu Chan, mm -hmm. holy S word that I cannot use because we are family friendly. <laughs> uh, Amazon has a complete Warehouse 13 for 20 pounds. That's really good. Yeah, I'm guessing definitely that's do about that. My friend Eddie will be happy. U.S.? I think about Maybe. 40, 50. I'm very terrible with yeah. uh, U.S. conversions. But, um, yeah. Also, yeah. really quick, I also want to say, I just realized also Tomb Raider and The Librarian. Also true. Tomb Raider and The Librarian. And when, when life and reality permits for me to have, uh, for the show, a really big set that we can use, I would love to do an actual, like, dungeon crawl for the compass rose to be like in an old ancient uh, uh like multi-level tomb and you have to get out of it you know something that's not as dark and heavy as as what we've been experiencing yeah. the past month yeah more PJ. lively yeah <laughs> <laughs> look also, you wanted spoopy yeah. i gave you spoopy <laughs> and also really quick i also want to say i really really like the way pathfinder second edition handles your Basically, this is multi-classing, as you said. Yes, yes. Uh, instead of having to deal with juggle two whole classes, oh, it's a feat. Just take it. Yeah. Boom. Done. Yeah, in, uh, in Pathfinder 1 and 3.5, uh, from the guys who made 3.5, they made Pathfinder 1 and 2, uh, the archetypes like these were prestige classes that would uh, kind of divert off your normal path and they were very special and hard to get into and sometimes they would either have like amazing overpowered benefits or sometimes they would just be very underwhelming mm -hmm. but this is brilliant because you're just you're just mixing in different layers to the character sandwich yeah. that i'm about to as the gm devour yeah. uh so also, without uh, further ado say, yeah, what's um, up 
I feel like uh, from the other game, prestige classes back then became what's now known as subclasses. But even then, you're still kind of juggling certain things, and not all subclasses could be it from your main class. Doing what a Pathfinder is doing is they are just giving you options and freedom, which I love. I love being able to customize your character pretty much however you want, while also staying with a certain, you know, guideline of rules, a framework, Absolutely. as you said. Absolutely. I think, I think the thing that is the most rewarding for any player is having the ability to create something so personal and so unique, but also in that, having it still be effective. Like, yeah. it, it, would be, it would be so pointless if you made this amazing, unique character that just sucked when it had to roll the dice to do something, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's got to be both personally fulfilling and also, like, mechanically fulfilling. Yeah. Um, but that being um, said, I think it's... Yeah, like, oh, yeah? That was really quick. I was gonna also, one last thing I want to add. Um, it's like, if you want to play a barbarian, but you also want to pick the archaeologist class, typically, yeah, a barbarian wouldn't be an archaeologist, but you know what? Pathfinder is going to let you do it. You could be a very angry... Very, oh my god, I just realized. You could be... You could be uh, Scrooge McDuck. Because Scrooge McDuck in the new DuckTales oh, is an yes. archaeologist also. So you yeah. could be Scrooge McDuck with, or Donald Duck who has an anger issues, but you're still pretty smart as an archaeologist. Yeah, no, you make a lot of good points. Actually, uh, there was a lot of old Scrooge McDuck cartoons mm -hmm. where they kind of established some of his wealth came from business, but some of his wealth came from amazing mm -hmm. uh, finds in, like, lost... Uh, tombs yeah. and and things so yeah and, and he was still angry and apparently super strong scrooge mcduck is the weirdest superhero and i'm not even being like flippant he is an actual superhero he punched someone to the moon he's yeah, insane uh, scrooge just, McDuck go look it up it's smarter than smarties um sharper <laughs> than the sharpies and um i i, I oh, totally forgot the, how it goes and there's one more thing but yeah, yeah, he's he's smarter than the smarties. He's he's, Tuppo, he's, he's strong, he's, tougher than the toughies, and then sharper yeah. than the sharpies. That's right. And I don't know what that means because I wasn't alive in 1940. <laughs> but uh, let's let's go right into the archaeologist with the dedication feat. Now, everything you're going to pick as an archetype or even multi-class is going to have to have that dedication feat. That thing that links in and says you can now take everything else from here on out. Um, but beyond just that, it does give you some kind of fun perk or benefit. At level two, at character level two, you can choose this dedication feat. The prerequisites are to be an archaeologist, you must be trained in perception, society, and thievery. Might be a hard buy-in for some classes, but, you know, with some creativity, you can get that. You, you are a student of peoples and their histories and are in constant pursuit of knowledge and artifacts from the past. You become an expert in society and thievery, which at level two is insane. Yeah. And you gain a plus one circumstance bonus to recall knowledge about ancient history, peoples, and cultures. You can select, I'm sorry, you can't select another dedication feat until you have gained two other feats from the archaeologist archetype. So, not only at level two do you become an expert in two skills, you can get a plus one bonus to recall knowledge about something. You can also, after taking two feats in this class, throw something else to the pile yeah. of, your, of your character sandwich. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Actually, you know what? I actually like the fact that you ha they make you make it so you have to take two other feats from the archetypes before you could kind of, I guess you say, uh, take on another archetype if you want or something. Mainly for the fact that this means, yeah, you are multiclassing, but you're also you're dedicating a lot of your time and effort into this profession, this you know class. Yeah. It makes sense, too, because if you just dipped in for one feet and then left, you wouldn't really be an archaeologist, right? Yeah. It wouldn't really go anywhere. You would be just a, a person who read a book and really liked said book. <laughs> and honestly, you can just get that reflection in a skilled proficiency. Yeah. Um, but I, gosh, I love the fact that level two, you just get expert in two major skills. My yeah, God. That's actually really – honestly, that's really useful. 
as an investigator in your game, PJ, mm -hmm. I'm an expert already at second level with one of my skills. Yeah, that is so, so good. Especially in Pathfinder where the bonuses do matter. Yeah. And I was going to say, like, some classes start off with like, an expert in saves to kind of show that they're meant to be rolling those kind of saves. But it's very hard to, at second level, for a lot of classes to become an expert in anything, you know, like mm -hmm. skills and attacks. So uh, that's awesome. Uh, why don't you hit with the Magical Scholastics? All right. For the Magical Scholastics, uh, your pre prerequisite is you have to be, well, you have to have archaeologist dedication, which... Makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is a feat you have to take at level. You can take at level four. While study is key to your success, a bit of magic is a helpful tool in discovering the secrets of the past. You gain detect magic, guidance, and read aura as occult innate cantrips. That is getting not just one, not two, but three cantrips that you could cast as many times as you want. Oh my god, that is so good. What's also important to note, <clears throat> pardon me, what's also important to note is that you get uh, one really good roleplay um, uh, mechanic, or one um, roleplay cantrip. You get one really good uh, exploration cantrip, and you get a buff cantrip. Mm -hmm. So if you are literally any class this will be a boon. Like, let's say you are that barbarian archaeologist. You're Scrooge McDuck, right? Yeah. You don't get any magic traditionally. All of a sudden, at level four, you're like, I have a spell that'll buff myself or a, 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 a buff a teammate, more than likely. I can tell when someone's lying. Not lying to I me. Mean, that's a different thing. But, like, I can see if someone's going to be a problem down the road. And I can see if something's magical. That barbarian now has such a unique toolkit. Or a monk or a rogue yeah. has such a unique toolkit for free really good no i think i'm gonna play honestly if you do 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 your uh, archaeology game, i'm making scrooge mcduck <clears throat> i would love that especially as a as an og scrooge mcduck fan and as a part scotsman i'm a huge fan of that mm -hmm. i'm not i'm not gonna attempt the accent though i'm gonna come up with a different accent because ooh, you do not want to hear my uh my scotsman <laughs> like i'm gonna offend i'm gonna probably offend <laughs> uh well I know Pengu Chan in the chat, I think, is representing Ireland. Uh, but if, if, if Pengu Chan, if you can give us some amazing tips on how to perfect our Irish or maybe even Scottish accents, please, I would be happy to attend such a lecture. All right, uh, PJ, why don't you take us uh, Settlement Scholastics? All right. So, Settlement Scholastics. Also at level four, you have to choose one of these two. So, if you don't want the three cantrips, you can get this. Your study opens up new horizons. You become an expert in a lore skill about a specific settlement. If you were already trained in that lore skill, you also become trained in the lore skill for a different settlement of your choice. Choose a single common or uncommon language prevalent in that settlement. You also learn that language. You can take this feat multiple times. When you take this feat again, you can choose a different settlement. So... Um, so basically, like, let's say we're playing a hyper-specific campaign, like, it's taking place in this amazing um, uh, three- or four-story uh, ancient ziggurats in Osmakan, right? Just off the, um, basically, like, the super forest of Osmakan that no one has been to since the end of the Fifth Age, beginning of the Sixth Age. That's a bunch of lore stuff that'll come out later. You, as a foreigner, are so entrenched in this world you can speak the local dialect of that area you know what's going on it's very very good however because it's so niche it is extremely impractical unless you are doing an entire campaign dedicated to one area that can be difficult uh we have a Sydney in chat saying uh, can we have this in real life too i'm guessing she's referring to magical scholastics yeah, yep. same here, same here. Honestly, those three cantrips are pretty much the some of the most useful cantrips any character can have, really, in uh, in a game. Yeah, and uh, talking about reading auras and knowing if people are bad or good or liars mm -hmm. or whatever. Oh, yeah. boy. Oh, boy. Uh, uh, Piggy uh, Chan is saying, uh, apparently, I'm guessing this is for 
Irish is to act drunk and slur your words. Oh, that's that's difficult because like I can imagine acting drunk and slurring my words in Irish or Scottish will be different. So like, you know, if if you're Irish and you're slurring your words because you're a wee drunk, just had a wee drink here. Uh, it's a little different. It's a little different if you're Scottish. And that also depends on what part of Scotland you're from and what part of Ireland you're from. Regional dialects are a thing, and I'm butchering both right now. So mm-hmm. let's move on. See, it's a lot better than mine. Mine will be straight to Donald Duck. What is it? Curse me kilts. Yeah, <laughs> that's uh, that's no good. That's no just, good. Just Bless me bagpipes. <laughs> Bless me bagpipes. Here's, here's the thing. Just watch a lot of Doctor Who and wait for David Tennant to get really animated because he, he becomes very Scottish well, when he becomes animated. David Tennant does voice Scrooge McDuck in a new cartoon. Exactly that, too. And, and I mean, like, what better voice to get for Scrooge McDuck than a real Scotsman oh. who has lost his goddamn mind? I mean, Apparently, it's perfect. Uh, Pengu Chan is doing a southern, southern thing with me. Bless you, Michael. you don't need oh. any, any tips. She's going, bless Michael. Uh, she's, she just blessed your heart. That's not... Oh, oof. yeah. Yep. <laughs> oh, right. Anyway, well, let's get back to the to the text here. Mm. Uh, feat level four, another feat at level four you can take is called Trap Finder. Yes, that is, uh, as I mentioned at the top of the archaeologist, what's really cool about some of these Pathfinder th- things is that they have... Uh, if you don't like... So if you don't like Magical Scholastics or Settlement Scholastics, you can just take the feat Trap Finder from the core cool rulebook Page 183. Mm-hmm. Um, well, this is also apparently Trap Finder is also a feat for investigators and rogues. Um, and this version of the Trap Finder feat is intended to be used with a archetype that has a different level for access than the original feat. So I'm guessing Trap Finder, you can either access it earlier or later as an investigator or rogue. But at level 4, as an archaeologist, you can get Trap Finder. Which... Uh, you have a, in, in, oh, pretty much you can sense, all right, ah, ah, little, little, I think it's the whole, you know, me attempting to do Scrooge McDuck is kind of making me now mush mouth. Uh, anyway, uh, pretty much, uh, your disability lets you, alerts you to dangers and presence of traps. You gain a plus one circumstance bonus to perception checks to find traps to AC against traps a, to AC against attacks made by traps and to saves against traps. Even if you aren't searching, you get a check to find traps that normally require you to be searching. You still need to meet any other requirements to find the trap. You could disable traps that require a proficiency rank of Master in Thievery. If you have Master Proficiency in Thievery, you can disable traps that require a proficiency rank of Legendary instead, and your Circumstance bonus against traps increase to plus two. Mm-hmm. So it's a it's a great anti-trap feat. So again, like if we're doing this, um, I'm probably just going to be fleshing out this entire in theoretical uh, one shot uh, in this episode. So let's say we're going through a multi-level ziggurat in the, uh, in the forbidden uh, god forest of Ozma Khan. Um, it will help you find all the horrible traps that were put up there to stop you from getting there in the first place. And if you activate it anyway, let's say you didn't see it and you activate it anyway, then you'll be defended against it a little bit. So that's good. Yeah, I'm um, just envisioning you're really good at grabbing that stick off the ground and jamming it into a gear. You know absolutely. which gear to jam up the trap with. Absolutely. Or the um, Indiana Jones, you know, the idol. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, I was about to say, like, you're really good at, like, tossing an idol and someone handing you a whip. Yeah. Uh, scholastic identification at level 7. <clears throat> you have to become a master in society. Possibly doable, but probably kind of hard at level seven to master society. Um, Maybe not. You have the knowledge needed to understand ancient texts and cultural artifacts. You can use society when deciphering writing, no matter the type of writing you are examining. You can also use society to identify magic when examining a magic item or location with cultural significance. This is awesome. If for nothing else than the ability to replace the arcana checks that you would normally get with a social skill. Yeah. That's really cool, especially if you are not someone who has a high training in arcana. 
And the fact that you are forced to be a master in society already means you're going to be smoking these checks left and right. Yeah, uh, right off the bat, a, a bard. Mm-hmm. Ooh, um, mm, probably not an alchemist. An investigator. That, oh, that's pretty much a given. An investigator or a rogue. But yeah. investigators pretty much, they do have... Their trained uh, skill is intelligence anyway, so I don't I didn't really count them because that's more of the obvious choice. But yeah, yeah. rogue, rogue. All right, all right, all right. Well, this is right. interesting. So yeah. you go from seven to eight. Usually, you don't get that so close together. But at level eight, you get another archaeologist feat. Michael Powell, mm -hmm. tell us what it is. It's called archaeologist luck. You first have to have the archaeologist dedication. And the trigger is you fail a trap. Uh, you fail a check against a trap, such as a thievery check to disable the trap, or a reflex save to avoid its effects. Um, what it does, you are more than just skillful. Your drive to find secrets of the past manifests as a strange kind of luck. Reroll, fail, check, and use the new result. That is so good. Being able to reroll a bad roll. <laughs> how many uh, times? Yeah. <laughs> how many October's times? October's games, like pretty much October's <laughs> games. Oh, uh, the God. Edge of Legend one shots in the October. If I, could, if any of us could have re-rolled some of those, re oh man, especially the last, the last game. Oof. Ooh, if I could have re-rolled that last re-roll. Ah uh, man, I'm not gonna lie. That episode took me a long time to write. It took me like ten hours to write over the span of two days, and I remember the final moments. And poor Sydney, like it's a do or die. There can only be one survivor, a roll off to decide the whole thing. Oh, and poor Sydney rolled a critical fail. Oh no! Yeah, no and she could have been like, you know what? I have archaeologist luck. I'm just gonna re-roll that. Yeah. Now I should say, it's one thing if it's environmental or narrative based or or what have you. This is specifically only mm -hmm. for traps. Yeah. However, if we do this one one shot I've been smoking out my butt about. Traps could mean taking a crap ton of damage, going under a horrific, like, mind-altering effect, or, I mean, haunts technically are traps for, like, the mind and the soul, but depending on your GM, they may, like, they may argue that maybe a haunt could work too. It depends. And also, Don't quote me on that. I guess if you, if you trip over something, like, specific, that will make you fall off a ledge. Depending on the DM, that might yeah. GM it might be considered a reroll with this. Yeah, especially I feel like if there's something that forces you physically to move off the ledge, like that you activated, I can see that's tripping a trap. Yeah, or um, a, a bunch of ball bearings. Whoop, oh no, I get a reroll. This yeah, is a or, kind of a trap. Or uh, some or caltrips, slick. some caltrips that a priest puts down and kills a whole bunch of goblins with. Yeah. Um. Why don't you handle the very last archaeologist one, the level 10 one? Oh, wait, did you do oh, you There's you another one, Delay Trap. That's for you. Oh, that's oh, my present trap. to you. <laughs> that's, the, that's the core rulebook 186. Hold on, I got to yeah. get up my core rulebook to one, uh, 186. It's such a big, such a it's big, a big awesome boy. book. Oh, God, this is a thick. With this two is a thick C's. Two C's. Okay. 186. I swear I was prepared. It's just really heavy. 186. In the words of Marty McFly, heavy. Yeah. This is actually a rogue feat that you can now choose instead of the other feats. So delay trap. You can jam the workings of a trap to delay its effects. Attempt a thievery check to disable a device on the trap. The DC to do so is increased by 5, and the effects are as follows. On a critical success, you prevent the trap from being triggered, or... You delay the activation until the start or end of your next turn, your choice. Success. You prevent the trap from being triggered, or you delay the activation until the end of your next turn, whatever is worse for you, GM's choice. Failure. No effect. Critical failure. You're flat-footed until the start of your next turn. Now, this is a reaction that is triggered when you... Uh, trigger a trap within reach. Now, why would you want to delay a trap with this much control, you might be asking? Well, I can see it for two options. One, 
get the hell out of Dodge when you would have no other choice otherwise, right? Like, we're screwed. The boulder is going to come rolling out of nowhere. We at least need a nice 30 to 90 feet of distance to really save our asses. Yeah. Or two, you're being followed by some bad guys. And what's more sweeter? Mm. How juicy is that berry if you can make that trap blow up in their face? Ooh, that is so. Oh, that is so good. That's um, chef kiss. Mwah! Good. Yeah. Delicious. Yeah, but also delayed trap. It's just being, like I said, it's a, it's a good feat. It's a good ability. And also, it's great to take if you're not a rogue. Say you're a barbarian or an investigator, or you know one of the other classes who don't have the delayed trap uh, access originally. Mm-hmm. But anyway, let's go to the capstone of the archaeologist's uh, feats. It's a feat that you t pick up at level 10 called Greater Magical Scalactics. You first have to have archaeologist dedication and magical scalactics, which honestly I recommend. That's, that's one of the main reasons I would go into this, this um, archetype. Anyway. You broaden your magical studies, allowing you to find the right path, detect objects, and conceal those objects from unscrupulous rivals. You can cast Argury, uh, Locate, and Non-Detection as occult innate spells each once per day. You can cast this Non-Detection spell only on an object, and it is automatically heightened to the same spell level as your cantrips from Magical Scalactics. So, it gives you more magic, which is always good. Mm -hmm. And it gives you some really good roleplay spells and some uh, uh, exploration spells. You can locate something. So if you're like, oh, I really need to find the exit or I need to find the switch that opens this whole thing up, yeah. you cast that spell. Augury, if we go into this room, how bad is it going to be? Wheel and woe. And non-detection is awesome because let's say you're hiding an idol. Just, just saying you're hiding an idol mm -hmm. from a member of your party who has been corrupted by greed and wants to steal it from you. Well... If they ambush you and betray you, now you can cast non-detection on the idol, and they're not going to find it anywhere. And then you can start role-playing and lying your ass off, like a good archaeologist should do. Yeah. Um, Pretty much, I like um, it's not bad. Honestly, I, I still like the first Galactic feat. I still think the first Galactic is better because, honestly, cantrips all day, every day. These you can only cast once per day, and also, I feel the spells here, at least, I want to say, uh, at least one of them feels kind of situational. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's a really nice um, thing to have. Yeah. But you may not be placed in a game or a situation where you'll really ever need it, and then you'll feel mm -hmm. kind of like, well, I wasted this feat. Yeah. Um, so, but what I still like about it is that it's taking a job. Like, I'm going to go to dig sites and look up dinosaur bones, that kind of thing. It's taking this kind of everyday job that maybe not a lot of people have, but people have, and it's putting it in a way where you actually get mechanical benefits from it. So if you're like, I'm an archaeologist and I'm also an investigator and I'm combining these things to like study and find the secrets of like Egyptology and the Incan ruins and all these things, you now have something that will be very potable, very tangible. So that being an investigator archaeologist, like it's a character sheet that matters now. It's not just a yeah. fluffy background story. Yeah, um, but really quick um... – Let's. So, what do you feel about this? Uh, about the archaeologist archetype? What are your feelings about it? My yeah. feelings? Yeah. I think it's. I think it's interesting. I think, as a GM and storyteller, it presents a need to create something for it. It mm -hmm. to me it presents this thing like this is so cool and niche. I can see how not a lot of people are going to want to pick this up because they're like, when am I ever going to use this? So now it, it makes me want to build a game where that is needed. One with adventure, like dig sites with haunted dinosaur bones, with giant uh, ancient traps in this big old monolith. Like it, it, it tells a story for me as a GM, yeah. and now I want to tell that story. 
Yeah, uh, for me, yes, it is very niche, but it's also very useful, not only for classes who may not be able to be more of the dungeoneering classes, like like said, like we said before, barbarian, monk, even cleric. But if it if you do pair it with a class that kind of um, I don't want to say abuses it, but uh, utilizes it to its maximum potential, like com combining archaeologists with either rogue or investigator. Rogue investigator or bard, those are three classes that the archaeologist could be paired with. To just it just adds so much to it, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that is actually a good point. It does give something. It's not what's I'm looking for. It won't be like super meta crunchy, but it would still give uh, those classes a lot more options, and you could almost be kind of flexible with how they can use it in like an urban environment. Mm -hmm. But let's move on. To the next one, and one that has been uh, kind of like an amazing, <laughs> the real hero of 2020, I guess I could say. Uh, oh, and that could, would be. Can I say oh, this? Can, a... I, can I say this? Can I say really quick? I just sure, want to sure, do sure. the scene from um, Starship Troopers. Medic! <laughs> we, you, Rico, you know what to do. Uh, so the real hero of 2020, the medics, those those first responders. Uh, who are killing it. So the medic, you've studied countless techniques for providing medical aid, making you a peerless doctor and healer. Um, so this is really cool moving forward. Kind of put a big banner on this. This is like for people who make medicine checks to heal people as opposed to just casting heal all the time. Yeah, you could probably still be a cleric and take this, but I don't believe it's going to really help your magical healing. This is more of Ways to really umph and and buff yeah. up your your mundane say, healing. If you're a cleric and take this, this is basically when you run out of spell slots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and also, the picture of the dude looks awesome. Like, look, look at this stud muffin right there. Look at this guy. He's like, I'm gonna heal you. I'm gonna heal your heart, and then I'm gonna break your heart. Like, oh man. Anyway, it kind of that kind of reminds me of it's a it's a manga. I don't think it's been translated yet. But it's um, I, I think it's called uh, medic battlefield medic or something where it's mm -hmm. it's a, it's a guy where uh, the main character gets transported to another world and becomes a healer. But in this world, the healers are like the most dangerous, badass, you know, people in the kingdom because. They use their healing magic to accelerate wounds and basically all that kind of stuff. Like, you know, to, yeah. Anyway, it's me no, nerding out a little bit. <laughs> no, I think that's super cool. Like, I, I played one really awesome, well, I, I had a lot of fun playing the character. He was, um, it was in a different system, and I was a battle medic for the military, and I was a sniper. But when I wasn't sniping, I was like, I was like Dr. House, like putting people back together. And I'd be like, okay, now don't die again because I don't want you to ruin all my hard work. Like I was surly as hell. Yeah, that. honestly, um, I would pair this class with maybe a martial class where, yeah, I'm a medic. And because of my medic training, I know where to hurt you. I was just going to say, I think, now this is without going into depth, but I think a ranger medic could be really cool. Oh, yeah. Especially because uh, you already have a high wisdom. Yeah. But uh, anyway, um, should I go into the dedication and then you take the next one? Sure, sure. All right. Uh, we got the medic dedication at level two. You have to be trained in medicine and t pick up the battle medicine feat, which is actually it's not that difficult, honestly. Uh, yeah. You become an expert in medicine, becoming an expert in whatever skill, so useful. When you succeed with battle medicine or treat wounds, the target gains Five additional HP at DC 20, 10 HP at DC 30, or 15 HP at DC 40. Once per day, you can use battle medicine on a creature that's temporarily immune. If you're a master in medicine, you could do this once per hour. And the special is you can't select another dedication feat until you gain two other feats from the medic archetype. This is 
Oh man, this would have been so useful in October. <laughs> so useful. I was thinking that. I was thinking that. And, and yeah, I want to say out the gate, this is so strong as a healer because when you use battle medicine, it makes you heal them quicker. And it does a D8. And depending on how much you roll, there are bonuses to that D8. So basically, as a, as a, as a player, right? You being a healer is now all about you versus you. You are imposing harder and harder DCs that if you can beat them, you can give so much stronger healing. And this is really fun because a lot of healers just do that thing where they're bored and they kind of like half roll a die and they go, you get this much, yay. But now you're gambling with yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Do I want to impose a DC 40 check to like heal this guy an extra 15 HP because he really, because they really need it? I don't know. And then no matter what you do, one of the fun things and sucky things about healing people with medicine checks is that they cannot be healed again for another hour or another day, depending on how bad you yeah. flub it, right? With this, that does not apply. You can heal them every hour, even if they're immune. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's not amazing. to say you can only use this once per day. You have other party members you could do this to. This is pretty much everybody gets one gamble heal, you know? And honestly, yeah. hitting at least a DC 30 at level two with expert in medicine is not out of the realm of possibility. Hitting a 40 might be difficult, but hit around a 30 with expert in medicine, that's actually, that's pretty average. Let's, let's see here. So an expert at level two, let's assume they have the maximum wisdom for a starting character, which mm -hmm. in Pathfinder 2 is 18. I think it caps out like around 24, 26, but yeah. It's very hard to get that. So you're getting a plus four. You are an expert in this. Uh, in that's a plus yeah. six. So that's a plus six to level two. Let's see. Four. Let's see. Two and four is six. Plus. Okay. So at level two, when you get this ability, you're getting a plus 10 on your roll, mm -hmm. right? So with a plus 10 on your roll, a DC of 30 is hard but doable. Basically, it means you're going to have to crit. But at least the DC 20 is very doable. Yeah. That's a 10 up. That's a 10 and I'm up I'm pretty save. sure you could take another feat that could up your medicine up a little bit, like a 1-2 one one bonus, and then you have uh, your other classes, maybe a cleric, cast guidance on you. Pretty much you're just stacking mm -hmm. a bunch of stuff. It, it, with every stack after the initial your initial stat bonuses, it just makes it easier and easier and easier. Once again, Bonuses matter in Pathfinder. They really do. Now, I will say this. Compared to the healer, um, the, the spell, the heal spell from the cleric might not be as juicy because the heal spell from the cleric basically functions as channel positive energy did, or at least up to the effect of channel positive energy with all three actions. However, um, this is done through mundane means, which means you don't really run out of it, and it's great for yeah. downtime actions. So... It's great in a different way. Highly recommend it, especially if you, if you will never get the heal spell. Like, let's say you're a champion, and you want to be, like, a champion that can heal, like a champion-cleric mm. combo. You no longer have to, like... Or a rogue. Exactly. You now have a mm. strong, potent heal. Um, but moving on, let's oh, go really to... Quick, really quick, oh. really quick. I just thought of something. Mm. This would be great to pair with the investigator who has a methodology that's based on medicine. Oh, oh, yeah. Yes. And you can make like Dr. Quinn medicine woman or yeah. you can house. make house. Uh, You're basically house, honestly. That would be awesome. That would be awesome. I think I know what graphic to use to put up when we talk about this. Just, I'm putting up house. Just Hugh Laurie looking surly. Um, <laughs> okay, so next up, doctor's visitation. Um, it can be one or two actions. It's the feat that you get at level four for this archetype. You move to provide immediate care to those who need it. Stride, then use one of the following, battle medicine or treat poison. You can spend uh, a second action instead to stride and then administer first aid or treat a condition. If you have it, see below. So what's great about this is let's say you need to just run to the front line. You know, like the barbarian's down. I hate to keep using that example. The wizard is down. What the wizard's doing in the front, no, no, we don't no, know. Let's just see this. PJ is down. <laughs> PJ's, PJ's down. The angry flexi boy, he's down. And now you just got to, like, haul ass to get there. So you can haul ass and heal them. 
and the amount of movement is one or two actions. At the end of that movement, you get to provide healing no matter what. Um, so it's really, really good for battlefield healing response time. It's yeah. really good. This is especially – honestly, take this feat if you know you're going to be using – if you're not using theater of mind. Yeah, or even if you are using theater of the mind, you can still be like, oh, crap, he's down. How far away is he, GM? And he can be like, he's 60 feet away. I'm going to huff it. This would be best utilized with a, with a battle map. Yeah. Sounding a little low on the audio there. I wonder if it's something on my end. Anyway, uh, oh well. we've got a treat condition. This one's a two-action feat. Oh, two-action ability. Which is a feat you could get at level four. Let's see. Uh, you have to have medic dedication first, and your requirements are you are holding healer's tools or you are wearing them and have one hand free. You treat an adjacent creature in an attempt to reduce the clumsy, enfeebled, or sickened condition. If a creature has multiple conditions from this list, choose one. Attempt a counteract check against the condition using. Your medicine modifier as your counteract modifier, and the condition source to determine the DC. You can't treat a condition that came from an artifact or effect above 20th level unless you have legendary medic. Even if you do, the counteract DC increases by 10. Treating a condition that's continuously applied under cer certain circumstances, for instance, an enfeebled condition, a good character gains from carrying an unholy weapon has no effect as long as the circumstances continue. Uh, critical success reduces the condition value by two, success reduces the condition value by one, and a critical failure increases the condition by one. All right. So it's a little complicated, but it sounds really cool because it sounds like you can uh, basically walk up to someone and remove a condition from them. Yeah. Uh, stunned, dazed, uh, uh, sickened, um, no, it's a, I, it's a clumsy, enfeebled, and sickened. Okay, so those three. Yeah. But those are still good. Those are very, very common. Um, and, reduced, and reducing a condition value by two could mean you remove it entirely at that yeah. point in time, as opposed to having to still wait around. Um, it's not bad. It's, it's not bad. Once again, this would be a great feat to pick up if you aren't a, spell, a healing spellcaster. Yeah. Um, holistic care, feat six. You are trained in diplomacy and you have treat condition that we just mentioned. You provide emotional and spiritual <laughs> care. I love that, that's, that's so great. You can add frightened, stupefied, and stunned to the list of conditions you can reduce with treat condition. If the stunned condition has a duration instead of a value, you, can, you can't use treat condition to reduce it. So you're, you have amazing bedside manner. Um, I like this because you know, not all medics and doctors have to treat uh, what's going on with the body. Sometimes they have to treat what's going on with the mind. Now, it's clearly not as in-depth as, say, like a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but it's sometimes the best way to help someone is to have them take a breath, mm -hmm. have them calm down, have them realize, you know what, hey, you're here, you're real, you're breathing, and you've been doing this for years. This is one day out of 365 that will repeat in numbers you can't even count. We're going to be okay. Yeah. You got this. Medicine check. Boom. There you go. No more. Yeah, you're, uh, basically, you're talking about 20, the year 2020 now. Huh. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. But yeah, um, this is a great ability, a uh, great thing to have. One of the things I'm actually, I'm kind of, I'm kind of surprised it doesn't have as a requirement is the fact that you have to have the tree condition feet first. I feel <laughs> you, to have holistic care. You should have the. Oh, actually, no, no. You are. You do have to have the treat condition first. Yeah. Okay. You also. You Never also mind. have to have. You also have to have diplomacy. So like, because you're, you're literally. I feel like you're literally talking them down. Uh, what I want to know is how come. How come the uh, emotional conditions such as uh, anxiety and depression aren't on this list? Um, but that's too real. We don't yeah. play. We don't play Pathfinder to get that real. All right. Anyway, uh, let's go with the capstone of medic is resuscitate which is a three action ability you will see uh, this is a feat you can take at level 16 you first have to have medic dedication and legendary in medicine 
you have to be holding healer's tools or wearing them and have a hand free. Also, the target's body must be mostly intact. Mostly. Heavily. It doesn't have air quotes in the book, but I'm putting air quotes in the book. Yeah, I'm going to say, you have to have at least your heart, your lungs, and your brain, and most of your stomach still intact. Yeah, maybe maybe like, no, like one limb. You just need one. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, you lost your arms, your legs. That's okay. As long as you have the stuff in the middle, that's that's fine. That's fine. But anyway, um, you can use medicine to resuscitate the dead. Attempt a DC 40 medicine check to revive a dead creature that's been dead for no more than three rounds. If you succeed, the, creature, the target returns to life with the effects of raised dead, except it still has a wounded condition before it had before dying, increased by one, or wounded one if it wasn't wounded before dying. Whether you succeed or fail, the target is temporarily immune to resuscitate for one day. This is actually really good. This is a non-magical raise the dead. Yep. What I love about this is that it's, if I'm reading this correctly, and I might not be, so please, if you're in the chat and we're talking about this and you know better, or you have a better understanding of this, please get in the chat and confirm. Um, it's not, it doesn't resuscitate them if they're dying. I'm sure it still can do that. Um, I think... I think it actually resuscitates them if they are actually dead. Yeah. Like yeah. dead, dead. Like yeah. you hit dying five, you're gone. they can't be longer than three minutes. Yeah. Because so it they, says here. They have to be freshly oh, yeah. dead. They have to be oh. Princess Bride dead. Got to add a little chocolate, it goes down smoother. Not not even three minutes, three rounds. Oh, so three rounds, have, three rounds. You have less than 20 seconds, which, I mean, makes sense. In reality, yeah. the, the brain and all the organs, if they don't have the blood and and the signals for like a certain i think it's four minutes time then they then they suffer massive damage yeah. and they they are I, dude, unusable. i'm just i'm just envisioning miracle max cramming a hershey's bar into the mouth of someone who just died <laughs> oh man i would just love to like now here's the problem though it does increase your wounded level so this is difficult because you have to, to really get the best out of this. You have to be dropped to death, right? Drop, mm -hmm. drop down into dying stage, die for all four rounds, and then be dead. So if someone, because the thing is, if someone brings you back and you drop, and they bring you back and you drop, your wounded stack, right? Yeah. So you could bring them back from the dead, and it still adds wounded to them. So eventually, it's going to get to the point where, and this is kind of what I like about Pathfinder. Eventually, it gets to the point where there's just nothing you can do anymore. You have fought hard, you have struggled on, and eventually the game just says, I'm sorry, there's nothing else that can be done. We've given you every opportunity, you're just dead. Yeah, um, like, I would definitely, the, like, still, honestly, even with all that, having access to a non-magical race of dead is really, really good. Oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely, especially all the non-magical classes that could benefit from this combination plus you can now have this this character who is a combat medic who may be um a survivalist right so they're a ranger out in the wilds for a long period of time and they have to know medicine in order to survive out there or you're a gunslinger paizo please bring out the gunslinger class and now you are you know dr quinn medicine woman or an investigator um you're basically you know? house yeah yeah and there can be a lot of really yeah. Pretty much, Fun you insult people, so. and then you heal them. <laughs> Would you like some Epsom salt for that sick burn I gave you? Oh. Actually, I don't think Epsom salt should be used on burns. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, what do you think about the medic uh, archetype, PJ? I, I love it. I think it's, it is complicated but flexible. It allows for literally anyone to be a good one-on-one -on -one healer doing so in a way that makes them get involved with their own mechanics. Um, and, and through that really provides a fun and flexible combination of things. You know, everyone's like, oh, I'm a battle medic. You know, like I'm like those soldiers that go out there in the field. And then they just play a cleric. And yeah. don't get me wrong, I love clerics. Clerics have been amazing since 3.5. Uh, they're truly inspired. But sometimes you don't want the cleric sometimes you yeah. want the fighter who's really good at applying a bandage you know really good at like sewing your guts back into your stomach 
Honestly, for me, I feel it has more. It's more overall useful than archaeologists, because honestly, a, any party, any group, having a at least a backup healer, and a backup healer who's on the front line most of the time, is extremely useful. Yeah, absolutely. I know. Um... I think originally, I don't know if, the, if this changed between the, uh, the episodes, but I want to say uh, La Pacifa Dorita took the battle medicine skill feat, which need for this. And it's such a great concept to be this big tanky frontline person and then go, oh, crap, like the back row just got nuked. I need to now break off the front line and heal the healer yeah. so that we can keep going. Or if, if you're like a champion or something or super tanky boy with heavy armor – just mm -hmm. okay cover me i'm going in to say that no man is left behind saving private private ryan style you know mm -hmm. that definitely I, I say medic super useful mm -hmm. for pretty much any class except for cleric because if you're a cleric you're already you, you don't need this class as a cleric but any <laughs> other class super useful I almost love because because again what I like about these archetypes is that they are offering you the player a chance to create something real and crunchy that could be only inferred or you know moved around in the second direction. It's like let's say you want to play a battle doctor or a plague doctor or anything where you actually need to have some sort of like medical license, right? Yeah. Um, you can now do that. You can now be like, oh, it's not just my backstory. I'm actually a doctor with a sword. Yeah. I'm an alchemist that throws bombs and, like, stitches people back yeah, up together. Alchemist. Super useful for alchemists. Um, I just thought of something. This would be super useful if your group got stuck into an anti-magic zone. You can't use in your anti-magic healing. Boom. Your healing abilities here are not magical. Yes, and that's another thing. It is so important to distinguish how powerful the mundane really is. That's why I think so many people, as, as crazy as magic can get, as powerful as magic can get, as insane as Fireball is, there will always be someone who falls back on a great sword or a sword and shield or a bow and arrow because they don't, like, they don't miscast. Yeah. They don't get I, shut off yeah. by a spell. Yeah. You just get I kinda wanna say this is one of my thoughts where when you play a caster class, you get to a kind of a kind of a groove where you end up using the magic as a crutch, like, oh I can solve anything with magic. And then first the first time that uh you get hit with that anti magic zone or yep. you know, you can't have access to your magic, you're completely shut down. This yeah. gives you options. I was I was playing an old campaign once and there was a this is definitely from like a GM crunchy headspace that this guy did. He he made a living magical construct that was buffed a whole bunch of magical sigils and then from like his person outward projected his own anti magic field. So I guess you could say if we were directly on the target then maybe we'd be immune. But the point is that this guy was so hard to fight. Because we were such a high level, everything we were doing was magic, right? And so we couldn't bypass his heavy hardness and his high uh, damage absorb and soak because the only way to do that would be through magic. And it was getting shut down. It was yeah. such a hard, hard puzzle to solve. Eventually, they just turned me into a giant ogre. I picked up a giant rock and I threw it at him because that rock ain't magic. Yep. Anyway, uh, let's move on to our last um, profession archetype. And really quick, uh, what's up? How you doing, Maynard? Yeah, Maynard, so great to see you in the chat. I hope everything yeah. is going great out there. And yeah, it's a crazy day for America. I hope we wake up oh, tomorrow yeah. feeling right. good. Anyway, this is this is the class that I'm really excited to talk about because, well, a certain uh, series dropped uh, this past weekend that. I'm a big fan of, if you can't tell by my shirt here. Mm hmm It's, uh, this is, hashtag, this is the way, Bounty Hunter. Mm hmm All right. Whether for coin or glory or justice, you know how to track, defeat, and capture dangerous in individuals. 
you're, you're accustomed to pursuing wanted posters, searching up on leads, and pursuing villains to hell and back. Sounds like a certain ranger we know. <laughs> uh... Yeah, there's no uh, there's no mid image characterization uh, for this class, but I'll show you at home. This is our wonderful uh, bounty hunter lady who uh, is killing it in the field right there. Look at those uh, golden glorious locks of glory. Look at her chainmail and her crossbow. She's ready to get work done. Let me see if I can't raise it up a little bit so you can see the full yep. picture. I'm so oh, bad at my own I got, camera. I got some uh, I got some image ideas that I want to put up. Uh... I'm just not 100% sure how well they're due because they're kind of copyrighted images on Twitch, but I'm pretty sure I could put it on YouTube. We could use that. Now, I want to read this whole thing, but I, feel, mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a funny feeling just from looking at the way they designed her that this could make for a very fun Witcher potential mm -hmm. class. But we'll see if I'm right or wrong as we go through this bad boy. But the very first thing, the bounty, the bounty hunter dedication feat. Taking this, of course. Oh, by the way, PJ... Oh, yeah? You just said it. A bouncer uh, dedication. That would be a great I arch type. It, did I say a bouncer? Oh, my you, God. It sounded like you said bouncer, bouncer in the beginning. Oh, no. But now I'm thinking, oh, my God, a bouncer arch type would be awesome. That would be – it would be like the Sentinel uh, feats from other games where it's like, sorry, buddy, you can't move. You're not in the list. Yeah. Um, it, would be a it would be a monk Sentinel. A monk, yeah, I would say it would be a yeah. nice – good addition to a monk. But anyway, uh, mm -hmm. read us the dedication. All right, Bounty Hunter Dedication. Level 2, you can take this dedication feat. You have to be trained in survival. A lot of things can do that. When focused on finding your quarry, you're relentless. You gain the Hunt Prey action. Ooh, you can use Hunt Prey to designate only a creature that you've seen, heard about, or learned about through some other means, such as a bounty board or wanted poster. In addition to the other benefits of Hunt Prey, you get a plus two circumstance bonus to checks to gather information about your prey. If you already have the Hunt Prey feature, you become an expert in survival and gain the circumstance bonus to gather information about your prey. You can still designate a creature you're tracking during exploration in addition to the conditions above. Special, you can't select any more uh, uh, archetypes until you take two from the bounty hunter archetype. So that's awesome. Basically, you're stealing a little bit from the ranger here, which is awesome because now you get like a nice little shallow multi-class of like a fighter ranger combo or a, a, a rogue ranger combo just for taking this. Yeah. Um, okay, this is slightly off topic, but every time I hear the words hunt prey, I, at the end I want to add uh, love, hunt prey love. I want that on a needle point. <laughs> I... Okay, now I have to make a bounty hunter with a shirt that says, like, live, laugh, hunt, pray. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> I just think it would be so funny to have, like, you know, this, like, I don't know. I need, I need to I, I isolate this a bit more because I don't know if I want, like, a Karen bounty hunter who's like, I'm sorry, but you running from the law is unacceptable. Thunk, you know? I have to figure out how I want to do this, but I think it could be hilarious. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, like you said before, uh, the bounty hunter dedication, getting the hump prey ability if you're not a, this is basically if you want the abilities of a ranger but don't want to go into ranger yeah yeah uh i would honestly i would pair this with maybe investigator <laughs> or even Sid, yeah, in, yeah. Sid, sorry i didn't mean to interrupt but this is funny sydney of hightower uh was saying hunt prey love uh we'll have a needs, meeting about that <laughs> she needs that t-shirt we make that please we might we might make it a thing i like it we'll see if uh we can get away with that copyright. But yeah, um, I, I would say add this, add this dedication, I mean, add this uh, archetype to investigators, to a Honestly, add this to any class of butt ranger so far. Well, that's what I like about this, is that you're now creating a very interesting combination of things, especially if you don't like the options the ranger has to give at yeah. level two, which is mostly like, okay, I can do a flurry of attacks with my sword. I can mark one target with my, my bone arrow and hit them really hard. You could make a swashbuckler bounty hunter and have yeah. him be a privateer. You could be, um, well, I still want to see how to make the witcher out of this because I have a vibe yeah. this could be a I, witcher I kind of want to say get, putting this, getting the dedication, and putting it on, yeah, like honestly, any class. But it's it's like taking a hunter, a ranger's hunter's edge without going into the ranger class. 
Mm-hmm. It's well, a ring, it's a hunter's it's a hunter's edge without the ranger. Yeah, and and some other things too. And they're like you could make a magical one, but we'll get into that later. Uh, yeah. Tools of the trade, level four. Michael Powell, please tell us more about. Oh, that. actually, uh, I from what where I'm reading, it's actually posse. Oh, that's weird. Oh, with the book they flipped them. Either okay. way. You, I'll do. How about I'll do posse and you do tools of the trade. Uh, posse, feet level four. Um, you have to have a uh, hunters bounty hunters dedication, and your requirements are you are designed designated prey with hunt prey, love. <laughs> By spending one minute giving guidance to help hunt down your prey, you instruct up to five willing creatures to assist you. They gain a plus one circumstance bonus to your seek to seek your prey, to track your prey, and gather information about your prey, you and your creatures assist you and the creatures assisting you gain a plus one circumstance bonus to initiative rolls when entering combat with your prey. This benefit lasts until you de- designate a new prey or your prey dies, whichever whichever comes first. An individual creature assisting you loses this benefit if they are out of your presence for too long to benefit from your instructions. This is usually one hour, but is determined by your GM. This is actually a great, like, area buff ability. And, like I said, it doesn't, it doesn't specify that uh, your five willing creatures have to be your, you know... People that you don't know. This could literally just be your party. This, uh, everybody, you get a plus one. Yeah. You're like Oprah. You get a plus one. You get a plus one. Everybody gets a, plus, gets a one. plus one. Yeah, I love that this is basically a team-wide buff, especially when, like, you are all on the same page. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, man, we all have to hunt down and kill General Korokos, the one of the big villains of Edge of Legend, and you think you've got, like, the track going, right? Now you got to hunt him down. You get a plus one everyone to finding this guy and then when you get into the fight you get a plus one to roll initiative it's 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 a, it's a really good buff at level four i'm mm-hmm. i'm i approve also maynard for the win um just put out the apropos of nothing can i just give both of our wonderful hosts credit for not being uh, i'll say very drunk by this point on this particular day oh i'm uh, planning to later on <laughs> i um uh-huh. i I got very drunk on Halloween, um, and I'm a little I'm a little uh, reluctant to drink. But I might. Uh, well, I'll see how I feel tomorrow. Right now, I'm just trying to like. Also, also want to give uh, Maynard a at the table uh, hero point for hunt, pray, love, favored terrain, earth, flavored meal, brunch. Oh yeah, we were laughing about that. I love the idea of like some some bounty hunter Karen going like. All right, girls, get your mascara on. Brunch is over, and I'm all out of uh, all out of mimosas. Let's get that target. But yeah, um, PJ, take it away with tools of the trade. Tools of the trade, also a choice for level four. You're well versed in weapons that allow you to bring bounties in alive. Big, big difference there. You are trained with the following weapons: bola, sap, and whip. You gain access to bolas. Whether you gain a class feature that grants you expert or greater proficiency in a given weapon or weapons, you also gain that proficiency in the weapons listed above. In addition, you take no penalty when making a non-lethal attack with a weapon without the non-lethal trait. So what's great about this is, let's say you don't want to be a killer character. You want to be someone who does non-lethal damage, like a certain cleric we know. You now have the ability with this to do non-lethal damage with any weapon, especially if it's non-lethal, you now have an ability to use sap, bullets, and whips, um, which do a bunch of non-lethal damage, uh, no matter what class you are. Um, however, sometimes you just gotta kill something. I, like Maynard put in the chat, let's get that Tarask. Uh, I would hate to see someone try to non-lethally bring in a Tarask. Oh, that would be horrible. We now have a pet Tarasque we use as a mount. No, no, I refuse. I <laughs> deny. No. But yeah, um, like I said, uh, Tools of Trade is pretty useful. I want to say pretty useful if you want to, like I said, you have to bring your target, you know, warm. When you can't yeah. bring your target cold, you got to bring him warm. Uh-huh. Yep, yep. Uh, which is great for character choices and, and other things. Like, I was thinking for just a car Ford, he... He would not kill his targets. He would bring them in alive. 
he would probably have tools of the trade to do so. There's this really cool 3.5 class um, called the Justicar or just or just just ECR, one of those two. And one of the things that was really cool about them is that they were bounty hunters who were trained in how to fight with manacles. So as they're fighting people, they're literally like hog tying them and they're they're cuffing them in yeah. combat and then taking them out of the fight so they can then drag and present them to oh, the courts that want that's them. That's nice. That's nice. So I imagine you should have something like that in uh, Edge of Legends or maybe a certain uh, whip wielder should have access to it. Just saying. Just saying. Maybe. Maybe. Well, you know, Jessica Ford would be happy to teach you how to how to fight. With I do the way have the a coupon. <laughs> you have a coupon. Yeah. Can I can I get uh, lessons in how to not create war? I will give you my coupon for war. <laughs> Jessica Jessica Ford would look at that and go, "Yes, tear it up immediately. Yes, let me teach you so you don't do it." <laughs> anyway, our next feat is at level six called Keep the Pace. It's a uh, reaction, I believe. You have to first have the bounty hunter dedication, and the trigger is your prey is within reach and attempts to move away from you. Your prey can escape. Stride up to your speed, allowing the foe and uh, stride up to your feet. Uh, bah. Stride up to your speed, following the foe and keeping it within reach throughout its movement until it stops moving or you've moved at your full speed. You can use keep the pace to burrow, climb, fly, or swim instead of stride if you have the corresponding movement type. That's pretty cool. That reminds me there was a uh, there was a class called the Avenger in another uh, uh, tabletop. It was basically like they broke down all of the uh, sources for power, like divine, primal, natural, whatever, and they broke it into like four or five jobs so that, you know, you'd be like the divine tank, the divine healer, the divine controller. The Avenger was the divine striker doing lots of damage. And one of the cool things they had is they had this instant teleport ability. If the person they marked got away from them, they just start teleporting after them. You know, like, you cannot escape kind of thing. And I like yeah, that this, here. This is great. Once again, this is one of those feats I would definitely take if we were playing more with a battle map. Yeah, and um, eventually, when COVID is over, we will probably be shifting towards something like that, mm -hmm. eventually. Yeah. Um, the last one, and this actually may work very well with Jessica Car Ford's fighting style of uh, manacle combat. The opportunistic grapple, reaction at level 8. Your prey is within your reach, you have at least one free hand, and your target is no more than one size larger than you. Um, imagine me with a Titan Grappler or whatever, you can fudge that a bit. Trigger, your prey critically fails a melee strike against you. You attempt an athletics check to grapple your prey. You are getting a free grapple check before your turn even comes up. If you know the grapple rules, this is great because taking that person and pinning them to the ground and hog tying them that takes a lot of actions yeah if you if you start your turn already in a successful grapple you can then just start breaking that person down so that your turn the entirety of your turn is going okay i've hog tied them they're completely out of combat we're moving on yeah uh once again this is a really great uh early level i want to say level a is still kind of considered early a really mm -hmm. early level uh, ability. Mm -hmm. um, we actually have one more, uh, one more feat, actually, PJ. Yep, and I have it right here. <sighs> and I have it right here. <laughs> uh, Look, it's uh, not the size of the book. It's the shut up. Yeah, <laughs> this is much, much lighter. <laughs> but anyway, it's called Double Prey. It's a feat at, you can get at level fourteen. You have to have the archetype of bounty hunter. This, once again, this is a ranger ability, but they also transfer it to Bounty Hunter. I'm not sure you get it. You get a Double Prey earlier or later. I'm pretty sure you get Double Prey earlier if you're a ranger. But once again, level 14, you can focus on two foes at once, hunting both of them down. You can use Hunt Prey action. You can pick two creatures as your prey. So pretty much it it bu basically buffs your, uh, I believe, your yeah, your hunt prey ability and also your posse, if you took posse. Yeah, so especially if you need to split the party. Dear God, I hope you don't. But if you do, at least now you can combine these two things to split the party and still still give them some 
help. So like, let's say you're, you're chasing like two outlaws who are brothers, right? Mm -hmm. And you know that the bill of services, you have to bring in both of them alive, right? So now what's fascinating is the brothers can be aware of this. As a GM, of course, I'd probably make them aware of this, and then they can just run away in separate directions. What you can do now is you can make sure you mark them both as your prey, give bonuses to the party, and say split up. And what's cool is that you can now have two fights going on at the same time, and now you can have two different types of enemies, like one's a gunslinger and one's a, a rogue or something. Mm -hmm. So now you get to fight two different boss fights at the same time. I, I just thought of something. If you want like, to. Say if you're a wizard or a character with a familiar or a animal companion, you could go, okay, I'm going to go with this group. I'm going to send my animal buddy or familiar or whatever with the other group, and you can see through the eyes of your familiar and also so that way you can actually kind of split your attention between two groups i really like that actually as as a um a druid um or maybe even going ranger bounty hunter and then just ignoring the things that are redundant uh you can then have you and your animal companion break off and hunt two different people yeah, at your once animal, yeah That's your, your really cool. uh, partner could, it's just basically you by proxy yeah. Now, Maynard said, uh, with regards to the opportunistic grappler, uh, an enemy critically failing against you is a rare occurrence. I don't know how useful I would call this. And that is a very good point. It's mm -hmm. not very often, or I should say, it's not very dependable to have uh, your enemy critically fail against you. Though, if they do, it is a nice gimme. Yeah. And what are you giving up at level eight? For whatever the class is, that really comes down to, especially because this bounty hunter can be can be worked in with mm -hmm. so many different things. Now, if I had to think about this, if I oh god, because my brain is so obsessed in The Witcher now, like you could take the bounty hunter and mix it with a magus. Yep, there it is. Oh, oh my god, that's amazing. Mm hmm, mm hmm, mm hmm, mm hmm. Oh, which by the way, um, Paizo recently released an article about uh, some of the stuff that they're going to do with the whole playtest. They got the, all the playtest information back from the Magus and Sumner and how they're going to change it in the upcoming release. Good, because, like, I like the Sumner, but the idea that um, your Eidolon and you share the exact same HP pool is very dangerous. And I would love them to find a better way to do that. I understand the, the Occult one has a lot of DR, a lot of damage resistance, but that's still, no, that's oh yeah. still no, um, scary. I believe in the article it read that, uh, well, we got, like, I think four different types of Eidolon in the playtest. They're going to apparently buff it up to about 10, maybe 10 plus different Eidolons. So there's going to be Fey Eidolons, Demonic Eidolons, and etc. See, I love that a lot because I felt like it was kind of cool that you could pick a Divine Eidolon. And you could argue the Divine Eidolon was a Celestial or a Devil. I like that distinction. No, no, I think, I think the Devils is a very different thing. But yeah. it just – it makes sense to me that you'd mm -hmm. want to have as many different Eidolons as possible. Yeah. But anyway, uh, with Bounty Hunter, what's your thoughts on Bounty Hunter, PJ? I'll say this. It's different. It's fun, and it's different, and it's specific, and you have to want that gameplay to want to invest in it. Um, because it does borrow off a bit of a shtick from the ranger, it does make me question if a ranger bounty hunter is really necessary. Yeah. Especially because I believe bounty hunter is also a background that you can take, mm -hmm. or a similar one exists. So... I feel like if you don't want to worry about buffing anyone else, buffing a group of people, which is really one of the best options there is, or if you don't want to worry about the uh, non-lethal aspects, the, the buffs to non-lethal damage, then you're better off probably just choosing a ranger with the background of Bounty Hunter. However, if you really want to play that lifestyle, the chase, the hunt, the, the investigation, and the capture – that's a really fun gameplay mechanic, and that class, that archetype, really adds to that. But you have to want it, or else it's probably not going to be beneficial. Yeah, um, as Miner said, too early to call on Bounty Hunter other than Ranger, except. And yeah, I kind of agree. This archetype, it's pretty much, you, for if you want to play a character, 
who's not a ranger but has ranger esque abilities. It's honestly it's a rangers it's a rangers hunter's edge without having to be a ranger. Yeah. I think I think what it goes really well with is the idea of building a pop culture icon. Mm-hmm. If you want to build a Mando, for example, bounty hunter archetype mixed in with a fighter, maybe mixed in with um I don't know something else. Mm-hmm. Uh, a rogue. A, like a, yeah. you could do a multi-class rogue fighter bounty hunter. Uh just for just for I'm thinking about the TV show. I, if, I think if we go really deep in Amanda lore, we'd find there'd be a different variation, but that's one. Like, I could definitely see, uh, like, if you go, if you want Mando and don't want to go to Ranger, I could see your Mando being a fighter with the bounty hunter archetype. Yeah. Um, also, if you do want to play a Witcher campaign, I think having a bounty hunter and a Magus or a bounty hunter and a sorcerer or whatever it could be really fun. Yeah. You know, you're doing the uh the magic stuff you're doing the combat stuff and you're getting benefits because like we've seen the witcher show um mostly he takes bills and he tracks down these these monsters he learns about it he prepares for it and he kills it Mm -hmm. my my three class picks to pair i want to say to pair uh bounty hunters up with just off the top of my head would be investigator Mm -hmm. rogue Mm-hmm. And champion. I can definitely see the rogue and investigator. I feel like the bounty hunter combined with those would make for some really good um, urban setting storytelling. Yeah. Like uh, trying to find someone running from the law, trying to find someone running from like a crime scene. They could give you some really cool stories with that. Uh, champion would be interesting. Like a champion bounty hunter. It's probably the closest thing to what Jessica is. Jessica Ford yeah. will have his own archetype that I will build for him to kind of reflect mm-hmm. the fun specific specificality that he exhibits. I also want to build um, a member of the Order of, um, Order of the Platinum Hammer um, and a few other things. We'll talk about that later on the show. Oh, I also want to say maybe also Monk, actually, now that I think about it more, because a Monk... They act, they're actually really good with the non-lethal damage as well. Ooh, that's a very good point. And yeah, grapple, I, think, I think a monk grapple. could make a good one. Yeah. Especially, uh, Maynard uh, says, it's important that. to keep in mind a character like the Witcher has to choose between certain classes, otherwise he isn't the Witcher anymore. It's a very different kind of method of character creation going end result to beginning rather than beginning to end result. So it, be, so it depends on whether you have a concrete idea in your head and want to modify it from there versus starting loose and getting concentrated. Yeah, getting concrete. Yeah, and, concrete. I, and, I, and I agree with you there. That's why I was saying this can be really good for when you want to build a pop culture thing. So, yeah. you're, all, so you're, you're already working with what you want the end result to look mm-hmm. like, and now you have to work backwards to get it, which yeah. we see all the time on YouTube and yeah. other things, like how to build this character in yeah. this edition. Exactly. End of the day... This is something you take if you don't want to. You really don't want to be a ranger, but have ranger ask abilities. Yeah, and and let's be real here. Like, it's kind of a shame how ranger has always had problems in other gaming editions. I think ranger in Pathfinder Two is probably one of the strongest rangers I've seen, especially early level rangers, mm-hmm. um, with their bonus damage. Oh man, but, PJ, but PJ, the, oh, really quick. Ugh. Yeah, the early level crossbow build yeah oh man the damage i I get one really meaty hit it's accurate and it deals a ton of damage and if you take the archer you get plus two uh damage for a crossbow i think you even reload faster like it's insane no crossbow ace and then i have that one ability i can use like with every with one focus point to basically give me another damage dice. Mm-hmm. That oh, God, was, yeah. That was insane. Oh. oh, yeah. And if you choose the, uh, what's the crossbow aficionado or whatever from the archer archetype, which is also in this book yeah. we're talking about, your damage, your, your damage for a crossbow goes up one die level. So if your crossbow does a D8, it's now a D10. Yeah. Base. Like I said, I, I, just, I envision Base. every time my um, catfolk ranger used his crossbow it doesn't it's not a crossbow anymore he's basically using a freaking howitzer or rail gun one yeah. big ass hit boom 
He's got a bar. Duh, 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 duh. Yeah. Um, or the brownie Rambo style. Call it. Oh yeah. So really fast, we thought it'd be kind of fun. Um, oh, really quick, um, PJ. Yeah. I do mm -hmm. want to cap this off. This or at least this part of the episode off with which of the three archetypes we talked about would is your choice, your pick. That's a very good point. So yeah. Get in the chat, get in the comment section, uh, and tell us which one you think is kind of better. Now, granted, these are very universalist, universalist uh, archetypes. You have the bounty hunter, which, you know, has a bit of a niche gameplay, but it can work with a lot of different classes. Mm -hmm. The medic, which is amazing. It's an amazing healer class that literally anyone can take. Um, and, and, and actually could help a closer cleric if they want to. Not that the closer cleric needs it, Sydney. Don't, don't <laughs> at me. Don't at me. Uh, and then the, the archaeologist, which is also kind of fun and gives a lot of perks to a lot of different classes, um, especially free magic. Who doesn't like yeah. free magic? Uh, but what about you, PJ? Of the three that we talked about, what's mm -hmm. your choice? Ooh, which your, that's tough. What, where does your vote goes to, go to? Ugh, the V word. Um, <laughs> uh, I already voted. Um, so I, yeah, I think weeks ago, if I had to choose one, honestly, I'd go with the, the medic because I could now give an amazing slew of options for any class. Like I could probably take a, um, a fighter or a champion or an alchemist or a rogue and make some really cool modern variants on something and then, and, and be useful no matter where I go, no matter what I'm doing. I really like, I really like the medic. Yeah, for me, I would, I would, I'm the same. My vote goes to the medic. Uh, meaning for a fact that archaeologist, a little too situational and bounty hunter, even though I love me some bounty hunter, <laughs> kind of lackluster. So, mm -hmm. yeah, with the, me the medic, thematically being able to be basically house or Dr. Quinn medicine woman, or just basically a combat medic thematically great. It adds a lot of story. And then mm. uh, mechanically non magical healing, being able to be a backup healer, always super useful. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I mean, the fact that you can bypass a lot of the problems with medicine checks out the gate, mind you. Like, yeah. I think the, the medic is interesting because while the whole thing is really cool, the strongest ability is the dedication feat, which is rare. You use the dedication feats like, eh, here's a plus one, here's two, here's two skills, <clears throat> whatever. The, the medic starts out the gate going like, you get to impose a massive penalty to yourself in lieu of massive healing bonuses. And don't worry about that hour immunity nonsense. You don't have to yeah. worry about that anymore. It's like, are you kidding? Yeah. And, okay. And the, okay. Yeah, and the fact that there's a lot of feats, you know, raw as written, mm -hmm. that helps you offset the the penalties. Yeah. And I love that you can also be a combat medic in the truest sense, running around response times for like one or two actions. You can move once or twice to a target, especially if like you got to heal someone in the back line. And then you, you like move uh, uh, somewhere between like, let's say 20, 30, 60 feet, like 50, 60 feet. You can run that long, get to a body and immediately start patching them up. Yeah. Yeah. So oh. yeah, I, I definitely, this one, of these three, I'm going with medic. Yeah. So, so tell us what you think. Tell us what combinations you like to play with. What really cool builds that you can make with an archaeologist or a medic or a bounty hunter. Um, and I will probably someday, when I fully flesh out the, the Justicar Fords archetype. All right, everyone. Well, that, that wraps up today's episode on occupational archetypes. Uh, the archaeologist, the medic, and the bounty hunter, turning your backstory into a crunchy, real character sheet. I personally like the medic, the medic more myself. But without further ado, it's time to say goodbye. Mr. Michael Powell, please tell everyone who you are and where they can find you on that sweet, sweet internet. Well, I'm Michael Powell, and you can find me all over the internet, such as my uh, social media handles, which are Mr. Kapow, that's M-R-K-A-P-A-O, or my 
Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash Michael Powell does stuff because I do a lot of stuff. And also I have a YouTube channel called Fantastic Tales of Adventure. We just recently broke 100 subscribers. Thank you super, super much. And yeah, um, on Thursdays on the Toyzilla Network channel here on Twitch, I'm part of a show called Toyzilla Live where we talk about toy news and nostalgia stuff. So yeah, that's really fun. But uh, where can we find you, PJ? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. My name is PJ McGaw. You can find me everywhere at PJ.McGaw. When I'm out here at the table with Michael Powell on Tuesdays, I am here at Wednesdays, 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, running the Pathfinder 2nd Edition homebrew flagship show, Edge of Legend. And we're just getting back from the Halloween series of uh, one-shots, and we're going right back in to the Green War. Or World War Orc, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, when I'm out here on Wednesdays, on Friday nights for a little while, we uh, we may be going on a brief hiatus. But for now, I'm going to be on the Life Action Roleplay Twitch page, 7 p.m. on Fridays, as we see what happens when a bunch of D&D characters graduate high school and go to community college. So tune in to find out what happens to a silver-haired, silver-tongued, half-elf bard, and what horrendous shenanigans I can get myself into. Until then, I'll see you same nat time. Same Nat channel. Be safe and go vote. Bye. Bye.